Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on conflict preparedness and protection takeaways for Ukraine and beyond. My name is Caitlin Hodge. I'm joining to you today, you today as secretary of the Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Advisory Group. Um, so a warm welcome on behalf of the co-chairs of this group and all of its members. As many of you know, this week we marked International Mine Awareness Day. So I've been thinking this week a lot about the narratives and messages that we, uh, as a mine action sector, talk about a lot. We speak of the legacies of war. We speak of the challenges that remain for years, decades beyond conflicts. Even our terminology, explosive remnants of war, focuses on what remains. These are really important points and really important messages to be clear on. But today, I would challenge you to think beyond this narrative. Uh, come with an open mind. We're here to talk about the holistic, a holistic understanding of the risks that people face, including when conflict is still happening. So the question we're gonna be asking is, what can protection look like when conflict is ongoing? To do this, we'll be using the lens of conflict preparedness and protection, or CPP. It is, and I'll, I'll read the quote here, a resilience-based approach designed to mitigate the effects of explosive weapons by empowering civilians to be better prepared to protect themselves during armed conflicts. For a long time in the advisory group, we've been talking about having a webinar on this topic. Um, it is not new that it is relevant. In 2020, for example, the GICHD highlighted in a review uh, that it is a methodology with promise for addressing gaps in knowledge on safe behaviors, both before and during conflicts. So why now? Well, the humanitarian crisis now unfolding in Ukraine has reminded us of the absolute urgency It has reminded us of the urgency to share experiences and to expand our sector's implementation of CPP. So we'll be making an effort to draw out good practices and lessons learned for Ukraine, but that will also be globally relevant, we believe, to other contexts that are experiencing conflict. A little bit about the structure for today. We're going to hear from two panelists who I will introduce in a moment on how their organizations have used the CPP framework in different contexts. We'll be doing this in rounds. Um, we'll have some presentations, but we'll also pose questions to explore CPP together. And then it will be your turn as the audience to do the same and pose your questions. We'll also hear from some other speakers or organizations who are implementing or thinking of implementing similar approaches. And lastly, uh, we have invited organizations who are working in Ukraine to participate in this webinar in ways that don't place um, too heavy of demands on their already taxed teams at the moment. So if there are partners who are uh, working in Ukraine or from Ukraine in the audience, and you have not already been in touch with me, I would welcome you to say hi in the chat um, and to write any updates there that you would like to give. I'd be happy to read them out. Similarly, if anyone has experience with CPP or other approaches, do feel free to share your tips in the chat uh, and we can share them. Finally, a few logistics notes before we kick it off. Um, please remember to keep yourself muted uh, at all times, um, unless you are asking a question have been called on. Uh, you may post your questions in the chat as we go. Um, or you can hold them for the last uh, half hour or so of the webinar when we will be doing a question and answer. And there you can also raise your virtual hand uh, and ask those questions verbally. The webinar, as you've probably seen, is being recorded. Uh, we will be sharing that recording at a later date, hopefully as soon as possible. It will be posted on the advisory group's YouTube channel. And lastly, um, I'll ask my colleague, Danielle Payne, to post a message in the chat, um, introducing herself. She is available if you have any technical questions um, that you want answered. So many thanks to Danielle for supporting. With all of that said, uh, I'm very pleased now to introduce our first panelist, um, who will be sharing uh, more on his organization, CPP Work. Uh, his name is Colin Bent and he is a Global Special Advisor on CPP for Norwegian People's Aid. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, introduction, Caitlin. Uh, as you noted, my name is Colin Bent. I'm uh, a global special advisor with Norwegian People's Aid, uh, focusing on our conflict preparedness and protection programming. Uh, I'm based in Sarajevo, so that's where I'm joining you from today. Uh, and uh, very happy to, to meet with all of you. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Great, so um, this will be a quick overview of what CPP is and what kind of work uh, Norwegian People's Aid is doing uh, in the area of CPP. And hopefully it's going to be um, kind of a starting off point for having a broader conversation on, on its place within uh, humanitarian frameworks and, and the kind of inter interventions that we're doing, and especially uh, given the situation in, in Ukraine and, and uh, where it might fit in. Uh, with our future interventions uh, or current interventions in the country. Um, so what is conflict preparedness and protection or CPP? You're going to hear me say CPP a lot in this in this presentation. Uh, but basically it's a framework that NPA uh, started um, developing um, in starting in 2013, 2014. Uh, which, which especially started picking up uh, in the aftermath of the 2014 conflict in, in Gaza. And it came out of um, a recognition and an understanding that, um, that conflict, armed conflict, is becoming um, more and more urbanized and, and, and characterized by the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. And this is having an extremely uh, devastating effect on the civilian population who should be prepared and protected uh, from the consequ consequences of war and especially the use of explosive weapons that have uh, wide area effects. Um, and uh, and uh, so what NPA did was we, we, we were looking at kind of the, from the framework of and the vantage point of mine action, um, what could be done in practical terms to uh, mitigate the uh, impact of explosive weapons and other conflict related threats on civilians living in conflict affected countries and communities. And, uh, and, and this is really the origin of, of, of our conflict preparedness and protection approach. Um, what is that? Um, basically, it's, it's a combination of, of various different uh, um, activities. Uh, at, the, at the global level, uh, NPA is very much engaged on uh, advocacy and raising international awareness about the use of WIPA, explosive weapons in populated areas, and their effects on, on civilians uh, living in conflict affected con communities. Um, uh, we conduct uh, needs assessments and surveys uh, as a part of our programming, a component of setting up our programs uh, and, and launching CPP interventions. What we're going to talk about most today is uh, the CPP safety, uh, conflict safety and risk education component of our programming, uh, which is, is mostly uh, uh, very similar to uh, typical IORE, um, but, uh, but done uh, during conflict and, and hopefully pre-conflict. Uh, pre um, and that's what we'll, we'll focus on today. Uh, we also do emergency equipment distribution and supplies distribution in conflict-affected countries. We do first aid training with civilians and, and actors across, uh, across the world. And another area that we have not yet uh, focused on, but would be um, something that we're, we're, we're looking at, at uh, working on is uh, physical uh, safety measures such as the construction of shelters and, and, uh, and other uh, physical protection measures that could be uh, um, implemented in communities for the protection of civilians. Where are we working? Um, we've uh, mostly focused uh, over the last few years uh, on do, conducting CPP in the Middle East, uh, primarily uh, Syria and Palestine. Uh, in Gaza, um, where, uh, where obviously the need uh, for uh, empowering civilians to be better prepared and better protected against explosive weapons 
uh, has been very high in in Iraq. Uh, we've done a project, and and we are now implementing also in Myanmar and uh, Somalia. And uh, I just got back from Yemen, and where we're setting up a, pro a program there, a project there uh, focused on on providing CPP uh, safety and risk education uh, there. And uh, of course, the situation in Ukraine has uh, meant that uh, NPA is very seriously considering uh, how it might be able to, to contribute to humanitarian CPP efforts in, in Ukraine. So what is CPP safety training? What is, what is it? Uh, and what are the components of it? Um, CPP is, was, was kind of created based off of this before, during, and after um, uh, structure uh, that exists in, in disaster uh, risk uh, reduction uh, and disaster management and um, and and uh, basically it's translating that 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 methodology that is used uh, for natural disasters and and using it for man-made disasters and so uh, our safety messaging when it comes to CPP uh, in in many contexts uh, focuses on what what civilians can do uh, before, uh, conflict, a period of conflict, in order for them to be uh, better prepared uh, for that, that contingency. Uh, so that involves uh, training civilians on emergency planning, on risk reduction measures in the home, what they can do uh, in the home to, to reduce the risks posed by blast and fragmentation uh, effects of explosions, um, identifying the safest location in one's home or building, uh, so that you can uh, seek shelter there during an attack, um, preparing a safe room where you and your family may be able to hibernate for extended periods of time uh, um, during a prolonged period of conflict, uh, preparing an emergency grab bag in case you need to evacuate. And then during, the, this is very much the physical actions that people should take during a uh, an attack using explosive weapons uh, to better protect themselves. Uh, so recognizing the warning signs of, uh, of an impending attack, um, how to take cover both inside and outside during an attack, um, how to adopt uh, the safest, safest position to protect your body uh, from the effects of an explosion, uh, the actions that you should take when, when hibernating uh, and, and when taking refuge in your, your safe room. And, uh, and staying informed during, during a prolonged period of conflict. And then lastly, uh, the actions that you should take and you, you and your family can take uh, after a period of conflict. Uh, so assessing the situation after an attack, um, uh, how to safely evacuate your building. Um, there's a, of course a very large component of explosive ordinance risk education that is delivered as part of this training. And then basic fire safety and basic first aid and survival tips. And these are just a few examples of what those kinds of safety messages can be uh, from our adult uh, CPP uh, trainings uh, presentation uh, from Syria. And some photos of what that kind of looks like. Uh, we do CPP training for uh, children uh, and, and adults uh, in train, tra training centers, schools, community centers. Etc. Um, CPP uh, should can and should be implemented um, throughout the conflict cycle, um, and uh, and and whereas EORA uh, is has traditionally been seen as as being done uh, post conflict, um, and uh, and is now being done in emergency scenarios uh, during conflict. Um, really, the best time to implement CVP and make sure that people are prepared for the eventuality of conflict is really before it ever happens or before uh, a conflict can escalate to, to the point where uh, the danger is, is critical. Um, so what kind of operational contexts uh, can we implement CVP in and, and, and why? Um, like I said, pre-conflict is is the best time to implement CPP so that uh, there there's ample time for 
uh, training people uh, and, and communicating the safety messages that we need to communicate in order for them to take preemptive action to prepare for conflict. Uh, but the question, of course, is what is a pre-conflict country? What is a, uh, a scenario where we would know that conflict is, is coming? Uh, and so there's a, uh, that's very difficult to, to assess. Uh, and, and of course, the, the, the focus has to be on, on conducting a needs assessment and identifying uh, a situation where, where CPP could be implemented uh, before a conflict ever happens based on the likelihood uh, and, and the risk of conflict in that country. Um, and I'm sure all of you can think of a few countries uh, where, where the, the possibility of, of conflict, future conflict, is not zero. Um, then we have lower intensity conflicts, and, and I, I, I hesitate to call Myanmar a, an example of this, but uh, these are conflicts that may be uh, less uh, characterized by the use of a WIPA and more characterized by the use of, of small arms like weapons and, and other, other conflict of, uh, uh, effects. Um, and, and that requires a different kind of safety messaging uh, from, from the kind of uh, uh, safety messaging that we use in protracted conflicts and higher intensity conflicts that have widespread use of WIPA uh, and, and, and uh, uh, explosive weapons with wide area effects. Of course, we have protracted con conflicts like Gaza and Hania will be uh, presenting on, on, on Gaza uh, in her presentation, but uh, Gaza, of course, um, is, is stuck in a perp perpetual uh, conflict um, that that flares up uh, on 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 a semi regular basis, um, and the impact uh, during those military escalations is extremely high, uh, and and the risk of conflict is continuous um, um, uh, over time, and then higher intensity conflicts. Of course, we can think of uh, the experience in Syria and and now in Ukraine, where uh, the use of explosive weapons in populated areas uh, and the impact of those weapons on civilians is extremely, extremely high. And there's a need for civilians to take preemptive uh, measures and measures to, to, to ensure the safety of themselves and their families and reduce the risks from explosive weapons. Let's talk very quickly about some of our observations on best practices and lessons learned when it comes to CPP. And we'll, we can talk about a bit about this before. But like I said, um, it's, really under, it's really important that we always understand uh, and contextualize CPP, just like Iore. But we need to make sure that the safety messaging we are uh, utilizing uh, is, is, is relevant, uh, that it's culturally uh, sensitive, and that we're targeting our uh, safety messages and our, our interventions uh, according to, to the need. And a good example of this uh, is, is the needs assessment that we're conducting right now in Yemen, um, where with Iore, perhaps uh, one of the best uh, indications of, of tar where we need to target um, may, be, uh, may be contamination data. Uh, it may be uh, civilian casualties from uh, and, and accidents uh, due to uh, ERW. Um, uh, and, and, and we can take a similar approach for CDP. So um, um, you, you can see here a, a map of, of, of Yemen, and um, there's actually very good um, data that's being produced by a project that has been running since 2018 in Yemen uh, called the CIMP, the Civilian Impact Monitoring Project, which um, tracks civilian casualties in Yemen due to armed conflict. And um, we can see where uh, people are, are dying and being injured um, from landmines, UXO and IEDs. Um, but actually the, the vast majority of, uh, of, of civilian casualties are occurring uh, due to shelling incidents and, uh, and, and ongoing conflict in, in other parts of the country. So having a balanced approach there uh, and, and looking to uh, where you can target your, your inter intervention most effectively to save the most lives and limbs uh, is really important. Um, uh, of course, uh, part of this process can be a need survey, uh, going into communities, finding out what people already know, uh, what safety measures are already practiced in, uh, in the context that we're working in, 
uh, and what are the major gaps. And, uh, and through survey, you can uh, find out uh, a very, very uh, important information that allows you to design your intervention um, and uh, understand what the needs are on the ground. Um, working in a conflict environment is often extremely difficult. Um, of course, the security situation poses a safety risk to, to staff and, uh, and can often very highly limit uh, and restrict access in some of the most high need communities uh, where you would want to be implementing CPP is often the highest risk and, and least accessible areas. And that's why uh, sometimes direct implementation is not the best approach. Um, and in, uh, in many contexts that we work in, we try to have a grassroots approach uh, where we work with local partners uh, and, and go into communities and train up people in communities um, so that uh, we have a, a kind of a sustainable approach and we have that access during um, situations where uh, sending out, uh, you know, send, mobilizing NPA teams, hiring NPA teams in uh, an active conflict uh, may be difficult. And the liaison and the trust building uh, that would be needed in order for us to direct implement uh, in, in, a, in, a con in a conflict environment may be extremely difficult. So working with uh, grassroots organizations and, and the capacities that already exist in countries uh, is, is an extremely useful approach. Um, of course, the biggest issue that uh, we run into is the fact that uh, we need to do remote management as part of our interventions um, uh, often. And, and that working in a conflict environment where uh, access is restricted um, requires us to do uh, very heavy monitoring QA, QM and, and tracking of operations. And, uh, and, and uh, for this, we use an electronic reporting system for the most part where um, reporting uh, for training sessions is done uh, via uh, cell phone or tablet via survey one, two, three. That data is automatically collated um, in our uh, information management system. And uh, we're able to track in real time, our operations often, um, and uh, and uh, we've set up a system whereby teams submit uh, photos and video uh, of their sessions on a on a regular basis, so that uh, we can QA and QA and them. Um, but uh, but certainly, working in conflict affected areas is is very uh, you know off, offers a lot of challenges when it comes to monitoring and and QA. Um, of course, there's there's a need to always have creative approaches. We do um, we do in person trainings uh, um, um, uh, with adults. We do in person trainings with with children. Um, we can use powerpoints and posters and uh, and and all sorts of different training aids to do that. Uh, and then also we should be as creative as possible, especially since um, um, working in a conflict uh, environment. Uh, requires a bit of creativity when it comes to our approaches. So uh, one approach, uh, a good example of, of how we've, we've tried to, to we've, we've done theater uh, sessions, uh, th theater shows in Gaza, um, where we've, we've had trained actors uh, um, deliver CPP messages through the, the medium of theater. And then uh, a relatively new concept that we uh, you have utilized over the last two years, both in, in Syria and Gaza, has been uh, uh, using traditional Hakawati or, or, or Arabic storytellers to deliver um, stories, children's stories that feature our safety messaging um, um, and, and using this kind of uh, cultural touchstone uh, and al almost dying art uh, to, to, to communicate uh, very effectively to, to children, um, uh, the kind of safety messages that you and I may have heard on or seen on TV uh, through public service announcements, PSAs, or, or GI Joe at the end of an episode, that sort of thing. And we also use, uh, of course, it's, it's very important to contextualize uh, CPP for children, um, because 
Uh, obviously, conflict is a very sensitive uh, thing to be talking about with children, and, and uh, it's very necessary for them to, to know certain information, uh, to better protect themselves and be prepared and have improved resilience. Um, but uh, but doing that in a way that isn't isn't traumatizing or 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 offering um, um, problematic uh, messaging is is a bit difficult. We 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 need to to, to program accordingly. So what we we've developed uh, children's magazines and posters and and that sort of thing, uh, communicating our safety messaging uh, using uh, ch children's kind of superheroes uh, that represent. Uh, different aspects of, of of our CPP programming, and uh, and and uh, each has its own their own personality and story behind them, and and children can identify with one or the other, uh, and 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 it adds uh, quite a lot of flavor to um, what it, uh, and and enables us to to connect with children on a, on a different way, and we've used these same characters um, in videos and in in uh, in in our theater shows as well. Um, social media is a really, really important tool, um, especially since uh, in the modern world, uh, even in uh, very difficult conflict environments, people may still have uh, or often still have uh, connection to the internet and, and are using social media, uh, often even as a tool to, to better understand the conflict and, and, and stay informed. Uh, so it's a, a useful uh, tool for us to reach people, uh, uh, especially in, in times of, of intense conflict. Um, so a good example was in May of last year when there was a, a massive uh, um, bout of armed conflict in, in Gaza, uh, a military escalation between uh, um, non-state uh, actors in, in Gaza and, and the Israeli Defense Forces, during which uh, over a se several days, um, uh, Gaza was subject to uh, massive expl uh, explosive weapons use uh, in populated areas. And so during that time, we had developed an, uh, quite a number of, of graphical and, and video safety messages leading up to the conflict. And we were able to use uh, targeted, uh, targeted uh, Facebook posts and, and promoted posts um, to, to get our messages out there. And, and during a period where we weren't able to deploy risk education teams, there's no other way to reach people, um, it becomes an extremely effective way to communicate during uh, during the, perhaps the most necessary time to get this messaging out to people, um, uh, these safety messages. And uh, and uh, in just a few days, we were able to, to reach um, uh, over 900,000 uh, Gazans uh, um, with, with this safety messaging. And with promoted posts and the tools that are available on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on, on YouTube, you can really target exactly the people that you want to target um, with the safety messaging, uh, and 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 that's an extremely useful tool. So um, we can see examples here of, of our. You can find us on on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, where where we have quite a lot of uh, Arabic language um, um, safety messages there, and uh, maybe a quick example of of some of the videos that we produce uh, here. كن حذرا عند حدوث هجوم مفاجئ وأنت في المنزل أو المدرسة عليك الاحتماء تحت أقرب أثاث صلب والابتعاد عن النوافذ واتخذ وضعية الحماية ولا تنسى إغلاق عينيك وحماية رأسك وأذنيك مع فتح فمك والتنفس بشكل طبيعي. So just quick, quick stories, quick videos, uh, easily digestible with quick messages about how to protect your, yourself, what the risks are, uh, and, and how to, to the actions that you should take uh, before, during, and after a conflict, whether preparing uh, to protect your body during an attack or, or in the aftermath of an attack. Uh, lastly, the most important thing, also a very important thing, is measuring results. How are we having, how do we know we're having an impact? And of course, the, it's very difficult to say how many, to quantify how many lives we're saving or how many people were not injured uh, when it comes to, to providing this kind of intervention. Um, so we, we, we want as much as possible to be able to measure uh, knowledge, attitudes, and practices, how they shift uh, with a sample of people who are not trained 
And then uh, a different sample of people, um, uh, same, same demographic and education, uh, et cetera, age uh, makeup, um, and a different group of people, not the same people as we, 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 we test our uh, pre-training. And uh, we're able to compare by asking the same questions uh, about safety messaging, uh, the safety messaging that's contained in our, in our, um, in our, in our safety trainings, um, we're able to see in kind of what the baseline is, uh, what what people believe, what their attitudes are, and we often find that people are 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 much are are not as risk averse as you'd you'd hope uh, when when living in a protracted conflict uh, and exposed to these threats, um, and uh, and they may not have a complete understanding of the uh, things that they can do to mitigate the risks of explosive weapons. And uh, so we're able to compare uh, the results of, of pre-training tests to, to those uh, who we, we test after training. And we're able to see kind of an impact on knowledge and attitudes and hopefully on practices. And, uh, but practices is much difficult, much more difficult to, to measure. Right now we're going back into a community in Gaza that we're, we, we've implemented CPP in, um, and we, we did that before the May conflict. And now we're going back into that, uh, that community to uh, interview and conduct, uh, conduct an assessment whereby hopefully we'll, we'll get a, a good understanding uh, of how much of this information and how this training uh, has been utilized um, um, to, uh, during, during that conflict. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I, I didn't include so much on Ukraine, um, but I think it's really important to just say uh, that a lot of um, our experiences uh, translate to, to Ukraine, and I think the need for CPP in Ukraine is very high. Um, Ukraine has a very well developed um, civil society sector and very advanced uh, emergency services and response mechanisms. Um, so it's we consider it extremely important to link in with the existing uh, um, existing capacities within Ukraine and to help uh, bolster, uh, augment, and and amplify the safety messaging that is already being put out uh, by. Uh, SESU, uh, Ministry of Defense, and other uh, other engaged CPP actors in in Ukraine, um, who are disseminating disseminating, disseminating uh, CPP type uh, safety messages, and uh, and have also generated tools and infrastructure that help protect uh, civilians. So as we move forward with uh, looking at how to engage with CPP in Ukraine, it's really important uh, that we and all, all of us um, try to link in with those existing uh, capacities and and try to 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 uh, help um, and and amplify those efforts uh, through the provision of of support and uh, resources. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Colin, for that really thought-provoking, informative presentation. I think it's given us a go all a good baseline understanding of, of CPP and how it's been applied in different contexts. So with that, and we'll come back to you in a little bit, um, I would like to zoom in on, on one particular context that you mentioned of, of Gaza. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce our next panelist, Hannah Albayumi. She's a senior EORE advisor and coordinator of the Mine Action Area of Responsibility for the UN Mine Action Service in Palestine. Um, Hannah, the floor is yours. Hannah has had a bit uh, of... Hello, everybody. Oh, good. Perfect. Uh, this You're is here. Hannah. Unfortunately, my internet is not really helping to have the... Hannah, are you with us? Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Perfect, yes, now. I was trying to connect to my laptop, uh, to my mobile, so I can turn the camera off on, but unfortunately, uh, it's disrupting. So I'll stick to no camera. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Hannah, as Caitlin introduced me from Palestine. Uh, I'll go directly to uh, 
and share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yep, thanks. Um, so, uh, uh, Colin has uh, given some overview or like a wider overview of CBP. And as Kitten said, um, I'll be focusing um, actually more on the concept of um, CBP, uh, especially through our experience uh, in Gaza. So throughout this uh, presentation, I'll be focusing on what CPP is, uh, the components of CPP, how it's different, and some um, uh, lessons learned and best practices. Um, so again, CPP is a, a resilience-based approach designed to mitigate the impact of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Through equipping um, uh, affected communities or civilians with knowledge to prepare and develop appropriate coping behaviors in the, of, in the event of armed conflict. Um, this approach is actually uh, bespoke and de derived from the, um, the needs of the community through uh, several community focus group uh, discussions where uh, threats were identified through those people, uh, existing coping mechanisms and strategies were also identified and based, of that, based on that, the, the CPP core messages were developed to assist those people to be able to protect themselves. Uh, this approach is, has two effects, um, or two main effects. One is in terms of the human security. It has a psychological impact on the kind of, let's say, disempowered population to be able to make preparations for their own safety and make sure or um, uh, got the feeling that they are in control despite the uncontrolled uh, uh, attacks or bombardment that is ongoing outside. The second one is for sure it assists population or affected communities to make small but impactful preparations that can enable them to have a better chance of surviving uh, this violent conflict. Uh, so CPP content is in a way or another the same content that Colin talked about, but um, uh, actually after our focus group discussions and testing of our curriculum uh, with the community, we have decided to uh, split up, uh, split it up into two main component, components. The first one, as you see, is preparedness, where um, targeted communities are educated to be better prepared prior to the emergency to be able to face various uh, threatening situations. And in this component, people learn uh, how to prepare a safer house, which is basically some risk reduction tips to make the house safer, uh, including uh, uh, turning off the, or removing the flammable items, making sure the windows are slightly open, covered with, um, with curtains, cardboards, etc. Um, and then it also teach people how to prepare a safe room or a safe location, not necessarily a room because it could be your corridor, for example. And here people are given with some characteristics or let's say criteria of the safest place or location in, in their house. And where, for example, it's, uh, it might be located in the middle of the building, not overlooking um, the main road, does not contain or with the least number of um, of uh, windows, etc. Uh, so people uh, have the criteria and they are able to identify what works the best for them or for their own structure or house. Um, and also prepare the, the basic needs, uh, basic needs such as, and, and it's of course it's different from one context to another and from one family to another. Um, and basically it's the like water, uh, food, uh, the, the basic needs of, uh, elderly, uh, children, people with disability, uh, to make sure that uh, the, the movement of people are minimized, especially in the act, during the active um, shilling or, um, or in case of lockdown, for example. And then also preparing uh, their emergency bag or emergency bags, depending on the number of the family where they have their all valuable stuff. Um, uh, in these bags, and 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 they also learn where it should be located to, to be taken during um, in case of uh, evacuation, and finally uh, to prepare the family evacuation plan. And 
here all the family members um, will be um, learning the, about the safe road to take in case of evacuation. The gathering points, if they're not in the same building or in the same um, house in the time of attacks. Uh, some also identifying roles and responsibilities, some safety tips on evac during evacuation, not using the elevator, sticking to the uh, wall side of the stairs, etc. And also some very important tips on how to transfer elderly people and people with disability. Uh, and then the other component is uh, protection. And of course, once those people ha are prepared and have uh, prepared these, um, uh, the preparations I just mentioned prior to the conflict, in this section, they will learn how to act safely to be able to protect themselves through various um, threatening situations. The main one is uh, in case of shelling, bombardment, or airstrikes. And here people learn how to act upon, uh, like for example, if they are um, encountering bombardment while they are in, in, uh, inside the house, uh, for example, to stay away from window, take the safety positions, and then move to the safe room if they are outside, to lower their position, to go to the nearest, nearest building, if they are in the car, to stop the building, uh, sorry, to stop the engine, etc. Also, in case of injuries and this is a very basic life-saving um, uh, tips section uh, where people, and I'll, I'll actually uh, talk about it more in the lessons learned section, but mainly here people learn how to save lives until the, the medical arrives help, like for example, stop the severe bleeding. And also at the same time, they learn how to deal with, especially parents, how to deal with some minor, let's say, accidents where, for example, if they got um, let's say like nose bleeding or dehydration or any minor accident um, or issue, they can then deal with it without the need to go out under the shilling, for example, to deal with uh, such minor issues. And also uh, dealing with various fire accidents or scenarios and also um, the explosive remnants of war, uh, the traditional your uh, messages. Um, CPP is different and useful for some reasons. It's designed to be a resilience-based training, as I said, where people are actually uh, educated to develop their capacity to be able to assess, assess the risks by themselves and find the most suitable ways to mitigate uh, during the armed conflict by themselves. So they are the ones who decide what works the best for, for them based on the criteria that we give the, to them through this training. It's also needs driven and pragmatic where it's as, as I told you at the beginning, it's based or it's, it's built and designed both based on the needs of the target community, which is uh, usually monitored and evaluated on regular basis to meet any emerging needs, to make sure that uh, the messages are correct, uh, to remove some or add new if there is a need. It also um, has practical solutions. Uh, and this is one of my favorite parts about CBP, is that we provide people with improvised and let's say at hand solutions where and, and techniques to be easily used by almost everyone rather than just relying on complex um, techniques or equipments that is not available or, or costly or expensive to them. For example, in the life-saving messages, they, we, okay, we, taught, we teach them how, to, how the standard first aid kit should be or should look like, or if they are able to, to get one in the house. But for example, if not, they can use whatever um, clean cloth they have as a bandage, et cetera. Um, in Gaza, it's women focused. And why? Uh, because we, for, for empowering, for, um, for the reasons of empowerment and multiplier effect, we say we are targeting about 70 to 80% of our CPP target as women. But again, um, consideration should, should be given to social norms in other contexts, because as also a lesson learned, um, in, in some 
specific areas in Gaza and also some other contexts outside Palestine. And when, for example, the communities are um, like extreme men, men or male dominant, dominant, for example, no, both women and men needs to be um, need to be equally targeted. Like, for example, men will not allow those women to uh, to um, carry out any actions without their involvement. Or, for example, men need to hear the knowledge firsthand from their source to be able to to get convinced. Um, it's interactive and uh, interactive learning approach where people are um, learning the message or getting the message through interaction with the facilitator and with the content uh, through role playing and reflection of their own experience and past experience. And one more favorite point is it's module based and the CPP content is divided, as you saw at the beginning, is divided into contact, into, sorry, uh, several uh, modules, which makes um, the content easily transferable and adaptable, adaptable to other contexts. Like, for example, the, the threat in Gaza is identified as um, uh, bombardment, airstrike, shelling, et cetera, but for example, and also uh, ERW type of threat, but for example, in other contexts, you can easily just remove the ERW part and, and replace it with IED, for example. And in other contexts, the, the threat might be uh, active shooter. It might also, um, you might find out that uh, no fire, for example, is not really uh, uh, um, a threat or a main threat in this context. But for example, it's like road safety. You And also this can go beyond mine action and go to other sectors. Like for example, you can include some health tips in another component like we did for example, um, in COVID, et cetera. Um, so that's it for the definition and concept of CPP. Um, to cover some lessons learned and best practices from our experience in Palestine, I'm gonna start with um, the inclusiveness of the CPP content. So after um, various focus group discussions with the people with disability, uh, we have found out that the main fear, let's say, for or worry for those people uh, during emergency or during armed conflict is that they always feel worried to be left behind because they might not get the message. They might not be aware that the message is, uh, that, that there is an, as an escalation happening, for example. So we decided, and with support from uh, some uh, leading agencies here in Gaza on people with disability, to make the, the content more inclusive, people with disability inclusive. Uh, as you see here in the picture, uh, the basic needs, the, um, the, um, the first aid kit, or for example, the, um, sorry, the, um, the emergency bag, uh, all the needs of those people with disability with various types of disabilities to be included. The language were also uh, tailored to suit various uh, people with disability. Uh, when targeting children, and in Gaza, we're not targeting, in, in Gaza en masse, we're not targeting children mainly in, um, in CPP, but we integrate some messages. So uh, games are also tailored uh, to suit different children with disability. Uh, video content, drawings, the messages, and also the activities themselves, TOT were delivered, etc. Uh, and now, like at, at this time, we are also developing, making sure that um, all the videos and the digital content has sign language. It's written in, on, on simple um, Arabic structure. It has a specific colors uh, for some specific types of disability. Uh, number two is do no harm. And um, I know we will be talking about it later, but um, uh, this actually was raised uh, after the last escalation happened in May 2021 in Palestine, in Gaza. And for me, actually, as one of the affected communities and who after the conflict, uh, uh, getting out of the conflict with a possible trauma, I found out that there should be something about ensuring the, the safety or the, um, the psychological and mental health uh, while delivering these messages. Because of course, EOR and CPP 
uh, could be very triggering toward trauma or to traumatized people. So also, again, some cooperation uh, were done in, 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 um, in, uh, with some uh, agencies uh, specialized in uh, mental health in Gaza. Disclaimers were added to digital and non-digital content. Staff received psychological first aid to be able to identify symptoms and prepare cases. Um, and also innovative mental health techniques were also added to the sessions, especially with kids and also with women. Some, for example, some short meditation or Im imagination exercise just to make sure that people got, uh, get, uh, will go out of the session uh, with at least uh, a less psychological impact, uh, a negative psychological impact. Um, and also uh, cooperation with the same specialized organization also was to uh, was done to include some mental tips during emergency. So for women or parents, how to deal with their with their children during emergency, how also they themselves can take care of their mental health, mental health. And again, that was based on uh, the request of about 80% of people who've been interviewed through these discussions. Um, and also talking about donor harm and mental health, it's also worth mentioning that it is, and as Colin already mentioned, um, uh, CPP could be very, very tricky with children. It's a still a life-saving message that uh, definitely needs to reach to reach children, especially in the emergency context. But also, we need to be to be very, very careful in formulating the message, uh, making sure that the message is um, tailored to like child-friendly ways, and also um, uh, not, for example, because in, in our focus group discussions and me, myself, and my family, like whenever, for example, the, 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 my nieces receive evacuation exercise in the, in the classroom or in the school, they, and that happened basically yesterday, they, call, they go back to their uh, parents saying that, no, we don't want uh, any conflict to happen again, and it seems that it's happening, so that's why they are training us on this. So it should be very carefully approached. Another point under do no, do no harm principle is the first aid section that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, at the, in the previous section um, uh, curriculum, we used to have a first aid, and we used to actually to call it first aid, basic first aid tips. And it was noticed um, uh, that uh, providing this section was creating some type of false impression among the trained um, uh, or targeted communities that they, if they, for example, have this sufficient knowledge, they can give some medical advice and they can act based on that. So uh, for this reason, and in order not to do any harm, we decided to minimize the messages and to reduce them to the most basic life-saving messages. And again, disclaimers was also added, emphasized from the, um, from the uh, facilitators and also uh, it, there was some discussions about uh, having a separate first aid um, training if there is a need for this. And finally, uh, talking about emergency and non-emergency settings uh, and um, CPP. Uh, so uh, in, let's say the normal, or not normal, let's say the non-emergency, uh, because you, you know, like the, in, in, in Palestine it's, or in Gaza, it's a protracted type of conflict. So there's always a likelihood that the, the next hostilities will happen very soon. Uh, so in the, in the times that are prior to the time of emergency, uh, conflict, uh, the session, the CPP session is, the comprehensive session is um, provided uh, uh, and lasts for at least 90 minutes to cover all the components that I mentioned at the beginning, and because it's also interactive and practical. But um, for the emergency context, and also not only emergency, but in some with some target groups or some vulnerable and remote areas where it's not also feasible to carry out or to bring these people to the CBOs in the middle of the city, for example, to sit down for 90 minutes, we found out that it should be um, like a briefer version of CBB uh, uh, can be created. 
and and it was actually created and added to some EOR messages to be delivered through field visits and street visits. And also another point is during emergency, we, um, we decided to focus on the core messages to make it easily picked up by people who are really busy with, uh, with uh, getting alive or survive the conflict. Um, so these core messages, um, it can just focus on some main messages of like how to, to get prepared and how to protect yourselves. Um, and uh, these messages should be very short, concise, precise, and also inclusive. And that's one of also the many, uh, the, the, um, the very important points, because during emergency, we might not be able to tailor uh, the, the messages into e each specific uh, target group or people with disability, like with hearing uh, uh, disabilities, for example, or with physical disabilities. So the message can be inclusive uh, and accessible to be read and um, understood by everyone. Um, and also uh, digital content uh, proved to be one of them, uh, or social media, one of the main uh, channels where uh, the message can reach people in the fastest way. And um, it was proved actually through our experience along with our partners and the number of um, uh, Mine Action Working Group uh, members, including NPA, as, as Colin mentioned, uh, uh, it was proved how important social media, social media was. Uh, uh, several posts and, um, and voice messages were uh, disseminated throughout various um, platforms, uh, implementing partners and partners, um, uh, pages, uh, Facebook pages, Instagram, uh, Twitter, um, and also Telegram and, and many other uh, platforms. Uh, we also used influencers. Um, and uh, it was really interesting to see how fast it was uh, like I personally received these posts, uh, these posts that I uh, um, I created and during emergency, I received them from my family just to make sure that I am safe. And this family lives in a remote area, and they don't even know what I work or if I know these messages or not. Um, and also based on that, an emergency package uh, after the last conflict were prepared. Uh, short and very focused uh, designs uh, prepared uh, or it was designed in a way uh, to easily get viral and easily disseminated through these platforms. This uh, emergency package, as you, as you can see here, uh, consists of posters. Uh, those posters were, and, and also again, in, during emergency, the, we, we tried to design our activities to be as, let's say, holistic as possible um, because it's emergency. And of course, internet is there, but we might lose it. Radio is there, but we might lose it. TV is there, but we might lose it. And also, um, uh, some people might not have access to printed materials. So we made sure to include as most, as many uh, uh, tools as we can. Uh, posters were printed and stocked in their shelters in case of um, IDBs and, um, and uh, uh, pe uh, people moving to um, UNRWA shelters. Radio message are now, messages are now prepared, uh, recorded, and even uh, some contract um, on standby contracts is in place just to activate the plan whenever uh, the emergency take place. And also social media content, as I told you, it's um, designed differently to suit different platforms, as you see in the picture here and in the video that I'm gonna um, run now and end the presentation with. It's designed, for example, here to suit the um, reel and also to suit the story on Instagram and Facebook. Others to, to are more appropriate for Facebook and Instagram posts, um, etc. So I'm just going to end up uh, the presentation with some samples of our um, uh, digital content. It's actually uh, it got some uh, subtitles in English at the bottom.
Okay, so that's it for me uh, for now. And of course, um, more maybe questions and points to be discussed um, uh, after the presentation. Uh, so um, I'm here and open to answer any questions in relation to CPP. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, I think those were a lot of really interesting good practices and lessons learned that you shared. I loved that you touched on uh, the mental health aspects and also inclusion of persons with disabilities. And I think what you said also about, you know, the differences between emergency and non-emergency contexts um, can have a lot of relevance, including for partners in Ukraine. So before moving to, to some questions, uh, I would like to read out. So you'll recall that I mentioned we reached out to partners in Ukraine um, and I received a statement from the HALO Trust, uh, which I would like to share with you now. HALO is currently putting out key EORE messaging on social media covering explosive ordnance for a range of different items, destroyed or abandoned armed fighting vehicles, damaged buildings, and other potentially booby-trapped objects. The key messages are, one, do not go near these items, two, do not touch these items, and three, report them to the state emergency services via 101 or 112. We are also working to provide risk education for other humanitarian actors to help their staff stay safer on the ground and are working to return to in-person EURE and scale this activity up significantly. We know we want to integrate more CPP messaging into what we do, which is why we're attending today. We're also working to integrate more behavior change communication related messaging into our materials and message delivery and finding it a challenge when the current behaviors and motivations for those behaviors may be so different now from what they were just a few months ago. So we're needing to learn and adapt as we go in order to send the right messages to the right groups. We appreciate the chance to attend this webinar today and are looking forward to continuing to work with the other organizations, both within and outside the mine action sector to support the humanitarian efforts in Ukraine. Um, so many thanks to the HALO Trust for that statement. Um, I am going to pose a couple questions now for our panelists. Uh, because you so thoroughly um, covered uh, many things in your presentations, I hope you'll forgive me, dear panelists, that I'm going to go slightly off script um, and ask you a, a couple different questions before opening it up for the audience. Um, so the first one that I would like to ask is, um, both of you talked about the range of topics that are covered in CPP presentations. And there was a wide range of areas there from fire safety and first aid. Um, I saw about postures on how to take um, building awareness, where to be in a building. Um, even Hannah, you mentioned meditation and um, mental health tips. So, a lot of these areas go beyond, for instance, what mine action organizations traditionally work on. Um, it'd be, I think, useful to hear how you've gone about developing that content um, and also developing training curriculum for, for the trainers and the community focal points that you're working with. Do you work with other partners? And if so, who? Do you have a global expertise on this? Um, either Colin or Hana, would you be? Uh, okay, I can start. Great, thanks. Um, so as I told you, it's um, usually we, we are doing our, well, before starting building the, um, the unmanned CPP curriculum, we have carried out focus group discussions. And without these focus group discussions, we will not be able actually to identify the exact needs of these communities. And, um, and by, or through these, focus group discussions, um, continuous observations. And I can't say that it's easy 
uh, for the UN in, let's say, Gaza context, I'm not sure about other contexts, to carry out um, like full surveys uh, due to some government restrictions, etc. But we also make sure to regularly uh, meet with the communities, uh, include as different target groups as possible to make sure that we cover, uh, to, to listen to them. So CPP is based on what they ask us for, basically. Um, and um, talking about beyond mine action messages or, or points uh, covered in CPP, again, it's all related to protection. And if, for example, people, let's say, you mentioned the example of mental health. If people are, um, uh, for example, received the ER or CPP message and they got triggered, so this might take them to the total opposite of what we are trying to, to deliver to them or try to protect them from. So these um, other messages that are not really um, uh, mainly related or linked to armed uh, or weapons or, or explosive remnants of war, et cetera, are still as important as they are to make sure that these messages are um, implemented. Um, I hope I got the question um, correctly and, and the answer was uh, helpful. Thanks, Hannah. Colin, did you have anything you would like to add? No, I think, oh, well, yeah, I think uh, Hania gave some very good uh, points there. Um, to talk a bit about uh, NPA's approach on it, um, we developed many of the, um, the, the safety messages about uh, focused on IWIPA. Um, um, early on when we were designing uh, our CPP approach uh, uh, and and we had dedicated resources for that uh, which was was uh, and, and that took uh, quite a quite a long period of time um, but after that you know kind of uh, NPA has been very lucky to be a partnership-based organization and um, in contexts like Gaza Syria uh, where have you, um, we've been present for quite quite some time and we have uh, our own experience, but also uh, the accumulated experience and, and connections and linkages uh, of our implementing partners in those countries. And so um, it, basically when going into a new context, uh, which we're, we're, we're tr trying to do as we expand uh, our own CPP programming, um, to new contexts, um, there's there's a few elements there that I think are, are really key. Uh, the first is baseline assessment and survey. So um, there's kind of a desk assessment. Uh, hopefully, you're, you're also going into the country, uh, meeting with people, meeting with key actors, uh, mapping out uh, emergency services and what kind of uh, conflict mitigation measures are currently in place. Uh, then you're doing a survey, so you're 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 going into communities uh, and and targeting the communities that are the most conflict affected and, or or most at risk, and and you're going in and, and doing uh, let's say in in Gaza, in Syria, in Myanmar, other other contexts that we're we're working in, um, you know uh, it could be a very long survey uh, where we're asking about um, all of the questions we might need to to ask. Um, to understand what kind of safety measures, measures are already being practiced by people in the context, what the threats are, what the needs are, and, and what the gaps are when it comes to knowledge and skills and, and practices. And based off of that, um, you know, and working with our partners, we can run workshops in the countries and, and, uh, and prototype uh, the safety messages, uh, graphics, videos, what have you, that we're going to use in that context to make it very specific to uh, the, the threats that are existing in those, those contexts uh, and, and make it accessible and, and culturally uh, appropriate uh, and and uh, and relevant um, uh, through that, and then the last um, the kind of as you implement, um, you get a lot of feedback. Uh, you do um, beneficiary uh, interviews, uh, focus groups, and and uh, and and pre and post testing, and through that you're able to have a kind of feedback mechanism, uh, a loop whereby you're continuously changing and improving and adapting your safety messages and, and content uh, and, and uh, in order to better uh, meet the needs that you're, you're seeing on the ground. Thanks both of you for those answers.
Um, being cognizant of time and wanting to now open it up to the floor for questions, um, I would encourage you, if you do have questions, to start putting them in the chat. I've already seen uh, one that we'll, we'll come back to in a moment. Um, first, I would, though, like to, to actually give the floor um, to Lou, uh, if you're here. Um, Lou Maresca is with the ICRC, which is another organization that does uh, work on protection during situations of armed conflict. So um, love to hear from you, uh, Lou, on anything that you can share from the ICRC perspective. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin. I hope you can all hear me. And uh, thanks for, for, for inviting me to, to attend this really interesting um, workshop. Um, I think um, Colin and, and Hannah have, have really kind of laid out, um, you know, the, the, the elements of, of CPP and, and many of the key messages that um, certainly we take and, and we try to apply in the situations in which, in which we work. Um, what, I, what I might just add to the discussion a little bit is just to, to maybe uh, contribute some of the, the challenges that we see, um, at least in, 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 in our experience. Um, I mean, we know that preparedness is important. I mean, it's critical. Um, we also know that I think, uh, um, you know, people generally don't look towards preparing until it's critical. <laughs> Um, you know, I, just as an anecdote, I mean, you know, um, already uh, since the, the situation in Ukraine began, um, I began asking my, my friends, so what are you doing to prepare yourselves here in Geneva for, you know, the potential, not a conflict, but for the disruption? You know, I'd be taking cash out of the bank and kept it at home. Um, whenever the supermarket has water on sale and I say we should go buy six or eight large packets just in case there's a disruption of the water service. They all look at me like I'm crazy. Um, but uh, this is the time to do it, right? Because uh, when uh, everybody's trying to do it, it becomes much more critical. So there's a certain reluctance, I think, in, in, in situations, you know, unless it's a, it's, a, it's a lingering type of threat, a lingering type of situation where violence and conflict are, are, are um, um, in the environment, um, but if it happens quickly, it's a bit more of a, of a different situation. So preparedness is important, but uh, there are definitely challenges, challenges there. Um, one point on preparedness, which we've seen in very, not often, but in some situations, um, if a state or the parties to a conflict are denying that there's a conflict or an upcoming conflict. Teaching a civilian population to prepare for a conflict can become sensitive. Um, sometimes the, the authorities or if it's an internal conflict and you have a dialogue, um, don't necessarily want this kind of activity. So kind of laying the ground in advance with the relevant authorities, whether it be national authorities or even the parties to an armed conflict. Um, can help smooth that, can help smooth that over. Um, of course, as it was highlighted of course, during conflict, you know, when fighting is ongoing, particularly now as we see it in, in Ukraine, the situation is much different in many of the ways in which we kind of normally used to working, um, you know, um, can be helpful, but also suffer from, from limitations. Uh, people in basements may not have access to the internet, you know, they may not have electricity passing um, you know, safety messages becomes a bit more a bit more challenging, as does the kind of assessing and, and you know, monitoring and surveillance that that we are used to in the kind of more of the mine action um, context, particularly in the most critical areas where people are being bombed and, and, and shelled. Um, so I think it's the the point which which uh, Halo made in its statement that you know indeed um, when it's on when it's a situation of ongoing conflict people's behavior change. And to some extent, people, people's priorities change. Um, you know, um, we have heard the uh, response on occasion, uh, you know, I don't need more messages, I need food and water, um, this kind of stuff. And I think that's important to take into account and in knowing um, the situation on the ground as it's happening. Uh, the last point that I don't want to take uh, too much time is just a little bit, the, the points has, has been repeated, um, you know, know your context, know your audience, um, be practical, be simple, make it measures that people can, can, can take themselves. Um, I would just, and I know this is the, the EORE uh, 
group and, and workshop, I would just flag two other elements that are part of our um, more of our risk awareness, safer behavior approach and methodology. Um, but at this, to some extent, already have, been, have not been given much attention in the discussion. Um, what is safety messaging for crossfire, which may not involve explosive weapons, uh, people who are out in the open or on roads? Um, and then, particularly with regards to knowing the context, I mean, we see this in Ukraine quite a bit, where you have scattered throughout the country nuclear facilities, um, chemical production facilities. Uh, we've had ammonia leaks, the reports of radiation leaks. Um, you know, communities and civilians who are located near these uh, near these kind of facilities um, may need a slightly different kind of messaging because the risks and the mitigation measures are going to be different in those kind of contexts. And I, I'll leave it at that. But thanks a lot for this discussion. It's been really, really interesting. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Lou, uh, for further expanding um, kind of the range of threats that we're talking about. I think what you say also on preparedness is, is an interesting point to make. Um, to follow on that. So some of you will have probably seen that the your advisory group put out a question and answer document on Ukraine, um, which is now, thanks to support from GSEHD, available also in Ukrainian and Russian. Um, so one of the things that we, we, we talk about in that is that a country is not a monolith either. Um, and so while many parts of Ukraine are in a heightened emergency phase, um, there are also other areas where preparation messages could have relevance. I'm thinking particularly here of, of the East, for example. Um, so I, I think it's good to be thinking about um, what is the role of prevention um, and, and at what point does it come in um, and, and thinking regionally, not just uh, countrywide. So thanks, Lou. Um, coming back uh, to the, the, the questions um, that have been raised, I want to pull out a question for Colin and Hannah that was placed in the chat. Um, so this comes from Ambassador Stefano Toscano of the GSEHD. Uh, he writes, thanks to Hannah and Colin for the excellent presentation. How do you work towards ensuring sustainability of CPP efforts? To which extent are national or local authorities involved? I invite either of you to go ahead and, and take the floor. Yeah, I mean, uh, great question. Um, and I think uh, I mentioned before that we're very much a partnership based organization and, and always looking to see what kind of grassroots and existing capacities exist within the context that we're working in, so we can leverage those to reach more people and hopefully have a sustainable approach that lasts well beyond uh, NPA's intervention. So uh, good examples of that, uh, I'll give just two. Uh, we're able to do training of trainers with teachers um, and, and equip them with the training aids they uh, that they need in order to, to uh, present um, uh, the training sessions uh, for, for children in the schools. Um, that's a really great way of building a capacity over the over over years of implementing. You can you can make sure that uh, quite a large number of teachers within a school system are uh, are are have the knowledge and 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 training aids that they need to do that on a regular basis with very little input or support from 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 our side. Uh, and then you know in Myanmar we're training up um, the CPP focal points within. Uh, very small, uh, very rural uh, villages in in Myanmar uh, that are, especially during this conflict, uh, very difficult to, to reach. And that's and and training them up as as training of uh, with training of trainers, but also equipping them with uh, emergency equipment and and doing first aid training and 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 what have you, in order to enable them to to be a catalyst within their their community. Uh, from that point onwards, um, and to be able to coordinate with 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 other capacities uh, in the event of an emergency situation that affects their 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 location, their 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 village, uh, and so that they're better, the community is better able to organize itself uh, and and has that capacity within it. Hope that answers the questions for myself. Thanks, Colin. Um... I'm not seeing any other hands raised at the moment. Do feel free if you have a question to, to raise your hand um, or still put it in the chat. Um, so I would, I, I would ask another one myself. 
uh, Halo had mentioned that they're looking to integrate CPP messaging into what they're doing in Ukraine. Um, I know there have been a lot of different actors in Ukraine talking about, you know, what they can do um, with such an approach. What advice um, would you give to organizations in a context like Ukraine on how to get started? Um, I know you've talked already about kind of the training, the baseline assessment, but is there, you know, one particular good practice you want to highlight, one lesson learned, like what would be the one takeaway that you would think actors in Ukraine should walk away from this webinar with? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in because it's really important from our side, uh, because we're, we're in that process for Ukraine. We're just starting off on that process. And one thing that we're really finding very important or one thing that we're trying to emphasize is that you know uh ukraine is is very developed and uh and and has uh strong emergency services strong civil defense mechanisms in place and an infrastructure tools emergency services and and have quite a lot of uh, messaging and outreach uh themselves um so it's it's really important for us to kind of take uh take account of that and link in with the the with sesu with with other organizations that are engaged on it and and identify the gaps where can we actually help where can we uh, help to 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 amplify what they're already doing uh, and and do a baseline assessment uh, so that we're not duplicating effort or that we're not we're not uh, running counter to any of the the messaging that's already there and that we're 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 filling we're we're filling a need so we're in that process and I I would say if if there are colleagues out there uh, um, working with Ukrainian uh, emergency services or or working in Ukraine uh, right now uh, listening to this 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 uh, this this seminar um, feel free please to reach out to NPA uh, we would love to to talk to you and 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 try to figure out what we can do to help support. Uh, the local capacities uh, that are in Ukraine, and uh, and 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 see where we can fit in to your existing CPP uh, framework. Thanks, Colin. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like Hannah um, at her connection has dropped. Um, so, uh, if it's all right, we will. Uh, and she's coming back. Because I, I would love to hear her perspective also on this question. Um, let's just give her a moment to get reconnected. Um, Hannah, if you're with us again, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so a same question to you. Um, um, so actually, I lost you and that question raised by Stefano, I guess. <laughs> so I'm not sure where you are. But if I need to reflect on this, I can go ahead. No, no problem. Um, so, okay, then there, there are a couple questions. Um, the first one, uh, yes, raised by um, Ambassador Toscano related to how to ensure sustainability of CPP efforts and to what extent are national or local authorities involved. Um, and then the other question I think that we'll conclude with probably at this stage um, would be, what advice, what would be the one takeaway that you would hope that um, partners who are working in Ukraine or in contexts like Ukraine uh, would walk out of this webinar with? Okay, um, so for the first one, I have heard part of what Colin has answered. So basically we are doing the same in Unmasked Palestine and actually it's, um, uh, we're doing or we're delivering the CPP through implementing partners, never directly through Unmasked, unless it's the, like the UN or humanitarian agencies. Um, so uh, sustainability is ensured through this delivery of TOT to those implementing partner and all partners and also to um, um, big organizations like um, UNRWA, for example, where they have re uh, they can access a huge number of. Um, uh, Hannah, are you with us? Uh, Oh. Hi, we hear you. I think we hear you again. Oh, I was... Okay, so we only lost you one moment. Okay, so I was talking about UNRWA and cooperating or co um, uh, partnership with UNRWA to um, 
deliver uh, TOT to uh, some protection staff in there to be able to reach this huge number of beneficiaries and students that UNRWA can reach. So through TOT to do to such uh, partners like, uh, like UNRWA um, and uh, possibly with UNICEF and also uh, uh, to uh, uh, and this actually takes me to the next question. We are making our uh, doing our best to utilize the existing resources. So along Gaza, we have emergency committees that are should be active during emergency. Uh, we have some voluntary groups and bodies also uh, along um, actually reach every single area of Gaza, especially the vulnerable and remote um, areas. So. One of the best practices is to utilizing the existing resources instead of doubling the, the efforts and also exhausting the affected community with more than one uh, um, uh, organization delivering the message or even one more one than organization delivering the service, not necessarily the um, mine action related or your message. Like for example, we can, during emergency, you can use those um, uh, organizations or groups who can have, uh, who can, um, who are delivering humanitarian response, like food baskets, etc., cetera. Um, and also they might have uh, this um, uh, effect or, or they, they might have more access actually in emergency context. Uh, one more point to emphasize, I already covered is the um, uh, emergency uh, compatible uh, uh, con um, materials, especially, uh, digital materials and um, and uh, social media. That's it. Thank you, Hannah. Um, we do have a couple last messages in the chat. Uh, since we're about at the concluding time, I'm going to read them out, and I would suggest um, for the question that that we can take that via email. Um, when we disseminate the recording, the link to the recording uh, and um, the presentation materials. Um, and so that question is based on these experiences, have NPA and or UNMAS formalized any methodology uh, to approach CPP? Um, so we'll take that one in writing if that's all right. Um, Hannah, did you wanna come in? No, it's okay. Uh, I, I thought we, we need to reflect now. So yeah, we can take I think for time, um, we can do it that way. I, I want to be be cognizant of the, the time we've set out so um, we can provide a written answer. I also want to highlight a message that was um, put in the in the chat now by Celine Chang, Chang from HI. She is also co-chair of the advisory group. Um, so she's noted with all the different actors working in Ukraine and planning to expand CPP, it would be interesting to coordinate together and develop common CPP messages and approaches. We could bring this up at the next subcluster or working group meeting. Um, I think it sounds like an excellent suggestion. Um, and I think it's a, a good message to, to end the webinar on. Um, before you jump off, just a few uh, last messages that I would really like to say. Um, I first want to thank some people uh, I think we were really fortunate to have Colin and Hannah on this call today. Um, they're two of the leading voices, I would say, on CPP right now globally. Um, you'll have also seen that in the question and answer that we put out on um, on Ukraine, which is on the advisor group website, and Danielle is going to post links to it in the chat. The contact details of both Colin and Hannah are available in that document in the section on um, ERE during situations of on conflict. Um, so you can get in touch with them that way. I would also like to thank the rest of the organizing team beyond behind this webinar, Alberto and Benedicta from NPA and Danielle from GICHD. Uh, and especially I would like to thank the participants who have given statements, asked questions um, and come with open minds. We said we were going to challenge the narratives and I, I hope we have done that. Um, for those who have not joined one of these webinars before, this has been a special edition of what we call the EORE Hour. It is a monthly webinar series, usually on the last Wednesday of every month, not today. As I said, it's a special edition. Um, these are informal exchanges on topics of interest for risk education practitioners. So in the past, we've talked about harmonized approaches in West and Central Africa, digital risk education, a digital game in Lebanon, and broader risk mitigation approaches uh, to URE. All of the recordings are posted online on the advisory group's YouTube channel, uh, as will this one um, be posted as well very soon. 
So if you're interested in staying in the loop um, and registering for the ERE Hour Series, or even volunteering to host a webinar, uh, Danielle is gonna post the link for that also in the chat. Uh, a final comment for me, and then I'll, I'll just check in and see if either of our panelists want to give any final comment. Right now, as we are having this meeting, um, the fourth round of consultations on the development of a political declaration on the explosive, use of explosive weapons in populated areas is happening. Um, this declaration is intended to promote actions to, quote, enhance the protection of civilians in populated areas during conflict and reduce humanitarian harm from explosive weapons with wide area effects, including fostering behavior change, strengthening protection of civilians, and enhancing compliance with IHL. A number of states and organizations, including INU, NPA, MAG, HI, and the UN are all advocating for the inclusion of references to risk education in this declaration. So I think this webinar is really timely. As the political momentum builds, the time is now to ensure that our methods are fit for purpose. I hope that this webinar will be the start of more discussion on how approaches like CPP, um, and that also shared by Lou, can be drawn on to expand our understanding of explosive ordnance risk education and what it can achieve, even, and I might even say, especially when the bombs are still falling. Um, Colin, Hannah, I want to give you one last opportunity. Uh, any last words that you would like to share? Okay, looks like we're good. So thank you all again, uh, and I wish you a good rest of your day. Thanks very much for this, Caitlin, and to GICHD. Uh, really glad that we could connect uh, today in this way. And uh, thanks to everyone for your, your questions. And if you feel like you wanna reach out, uh, feel free to do that uh, bilaterally and we can, we can have a conversation. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, Caitlin and everyone. And I'm just, uh, I, I second what Colin said. Uh, I'm open to any questions. And if you would like to reach out separately or through Caitlin, um, we're open to this. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you all.